Welcome to Haven Heights Baptist Church. Welcome to those who are here, and welcome to those listening online. One announcement here this morning before we begin. There'll be no Wednesday evening activities this week. No Wednesday evening activities because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Let us take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship comes from Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 14. How then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Let's pray together. Father God, we gather this morning because there is good news to hear. And Father, we gather this morning to praise you for this good news. Father, our sins deserve your condemnation. And you would be perfectly right to say that we are people without a hope and without a future, and you would be perfectly right and just to condemn us, and yet you don't, and yet you have good news for us this morning. You are the one who sent your Son, and the Son of God became the Son of Man to live the life that we should have lived, only to die the death that we deserve to die, all so that because of him we might become the righteousness of God, and so that we might become your children, co-heirs with Christ, you tell us. Father, we praise you for this amazing, astonishing good news. And Father, this morning we thank you for the servants that you have sent to proclaim your message. And we thank you for the Sunday school teachers who have proclaimed your word this morning. We thank you for preachers all throughout this land who will preach your gospel and the good news of your son. We specifically think of Trinity Church. Father, we pray that you would bless the preaching of your word in their gathering, and we pray that your word would go forth untamed and unbridled. And we pray for our own gathering, and we pray that you would use even this preacher to proclaim your gospel in clarity and in power. Father, we pray that our hearts would be set ablaze by your truth. We pray that you would encourage us where encouragement is needed, and we also pray that you would challenge us if conviction is required. We pray for those who are hurting this day. And we think of those in difficult relationships. And Father, we pray that your word would speak to those who are hurting. And we think of those in financial difficulty. Father, we pray that you would encourage us that you are the one who will provide. And we think of those in pain and those who are worried about the virus. And Father, remind us that you are God. And remind us that this world is not our home. We pray for those listening at home, even now, and those listening on the radio later this afternoon. Father, we pray that many would hear and may know your gospel. Father, give them ears to hear. Give us ears to hear that we may hear of you and respond to you. We pray for our children and our grandchildren who do not know you or do not live for you. And Father, we pray that you would equip us even this hour to share you with them. Father, we pray that you would soften hearts, and also embolden our words. Father, we pray that you'd have your way in us. We pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. Good morning. May we continue worship and song this morning as we sing on the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all surround my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Okay, next we'll do There's Power in the Blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or be a victory to win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, flower in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in life's giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm chapter 67. Psalm 67.
May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest, God. Our God blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. The word of our God. thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumph of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim to spread throughout the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that calms the fears and bids my sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, the life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoners free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Alexander the Great once learned that someone else in his army was also named Alexander. Now, Alexander the Great was a ruthless military leader. Alexander the Great captured the world by the age of 23. But this other Alexander, not so much. The other Alexander was a coward. So Alexander the Great ordered that this other Alexander be brought before him. And Alexander the Great asked him, is it true that you're named Alexander? He said, yes, that's my name. And then Alexander the Great said, well, then tell me this. Are you named after me? And the other Alexander said, yes, it's true. I'm named after you. And then Alexander the Great said, well, then you have to decide. You either have to stop being a coward or you have to change your name. You have to decide. You're going to have the same name as me. You have to change your ways or change your name. In our passage this morning, we meet the first Christians in the Bible. People who are named after Christ. Named after Christ because they are like Christ. So much like Christ that they're given the name Christians, which even means little Christ. We continue on in our study of Acts Chapter 11, beginning in verse 19. Acts chapter 11. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw that the grace of God and saw what it had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. 
He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of the people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Our passage this morning takes place in the city of Antioch. Antioch is the third largest city in all the Roman world, so first there's Rome, the capital, then Alexander, and then Antioch. Not only was this a large city, this also was a city of, there was a melting pot of, of sorts, and so there were Greeks and Persians and Jews all inhabiting the city together. Not only was Antioch large, not only was it diverse, it was also licentious. So this city was known for the pursuit of pleasure. It's a modern-day Las Vegas. And in this city of diversity and differences, these Christians stand out. And these Christians are different from every other category of people. And and they're so different that a new word is formed. And they're called Christians because they don't fit any other category. So a new category has to be invented. And people look at these Christians and they say, you know, something's just different about them. And it's more than a culture. And it's more than a race. It's something altogether different. And so they wonder, what are we going to call these people? How are we going to identify them and distinguish them? And so they call them Christians. Church, may that be true of us. You know, may people look at us and may they say, you know, he's not quite a conservative, but he's not liberal. You know, I wouldn't say that she's a pushover, but she's not mean. I wouldn't say he's a drunk, but he likes to have fun. You know, they're just different. I don't really know how to figure it out, but they're different because they believe in Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to find ourselves in this place where we don't really fully fit with any other category. And because we don't really fit with any other category, we're something different. And that something different, of course, is because our primary category is Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. And notice here, and we'll get to this later on too, but notice that they're called Christians not by themselves, but by others. Others look at them and say, we're not really sure what to do with these people, and so we'll call them Christians. A life that is so affected by Christ that it's obvious to all. And so the natural question, and I hope the question we're asking this morning is this, well, how do I become like that then? Like, how do I become a Christian That my life is so impacted by Christ that everything else goes by the wayside. And that my life is so impacted by Christ that everyone else sees that and knows that. How do I become like that? Three words to guide our time to become a person like that. Number one, go. Go. Number two, know. Know. And number three, grow. Grow. Go, no, grow. Our first word this morning is go. To be a Christian requires that someone comes to us. For anyone to be a Christian, someone else first had to go. Like they had to go to us. Our call to worship this morning, Romans chapter 10, verse 14, paraphrase. How can you believe unless you hear of Jesus? And how can you hear of Jesus unless someone comes to you to tell you of Jesus? 
How can you believe unless you hear? And how can you hear unless someone comes to us? Look at verse 20. Some go to Antioch. And they go to Antioch to tell others the good news of Jesus. And when we read this passage, that's an intentional going. These people are going to those who know nothing of Jesus. Now that's different than verse 19. Verse 19, others went to Antioch. And we read that persecution broke out and these folks simply had nowhere to go. And so they say, hey, we'll go to Antioch. And they find themselves in Antioch. And when they get there, they begin to associate with people just like themselves. And in verse 19, these people look for those with whom they have things in common. And they're faithful. In verse 19, they're faithful to spread the word with those who are like them, with those whom they have things in common. But I want us to notice verse 20. In verse 20, we see those who intentionally go to Antioch. Those who intentionally seek out people who are not like them. Those who intentionally seek out people who know nothing of Jesus, and they go to them for the expressed purpose of telling them about Jesus. You know, it's these people who go with intentionality to tell them about Jesus in verse 21 that they see many coming to faith in Christ. Our country is increasingly growing in secularism. You know, there are more nuns than there's ever been before. And I don't mean nuns in a Catholic sense. I mean the nuns that when they fill out a survey and, and they're asked, what religion are you? They put none. They're nuns. And they don't have any religious affiliation. They don't identify with any traditions. You know, to be honest, these are probably not the people we typically associate with. The, the nuns, they're not the people we probably work with, and the nuns aren't the people that our kids play sports with, and the nuns aren't the people that we go out to eat with. They're not the people we typically associate with. And just being honest, the people we typically associate with, we should be faithful like those in 19, and we should invite those people to come to church, and we should tell them about Jesus, and there will be some fruit there. That'd be a good thing, and that's worth our effort. But simply talking about Jesus within our circle, that's not going to get the job done. And that's not going to reach Wauseon. It's not going to reach Fulton County. It's not going to reach Ohio for Jesus. What's going to reach Ohio and Fulton County and Wauseon for Jesus is an intentional going, like in verse 20. An intentional going to those who don't know Jesus. You know, in Acts chapter 8, Philip goes to Samaria, but he only goes there because persecution breaks out. And then in Acts chapter 10, Peter preaches to the Gentile Cornelius, but he only does that because God makes that explicitly clear. It's in Acts chapter 11 that for the first time, the church says, we have to intentionally go to those who are not like us to tell them about Jesus. That's the first time this happens in the book of Acts. They go to those who are not like them, and they go to them to tell them about Jesus. In verse 21, again, they see people coming to faith in Christ. And so we want to know, well, who are these people who are, who are going? Like, like, who's doing this? Who are these missionaries? And we wonder, is it the apostles? And no. And is it the deacons of Acts chapter 6? And, and no. The first people who decided that we're going to go and tell others about Jesus? Who's that? We don't know. We, we don't know. Like, their names aren't recorded. We read in verse 20 that some men. That's it. Some men, like just no-name people, went and did this. It was the no-names who left their homes to go to Antioch to tell others about Jesus. Jesus. And it's these no names, these people of almost no worldly significance who lead many people to faith in Christ. We live in the day and the age of the nuns, but we also live in the day and the age of the Christian celebrity. 
You, know, you can go home and you can turn on your TV this afternoon and you can see large churches that even with the COVID-19 pandemic are filled and you can see all of these famous TV preachers and there's conferences that feature our favorite preacher and there's podcasts and there's books and you know there's nothing wrong with Christian celebrity. And if the Lord gives us, any of us, a platform like that, I pray that we would use it and be faithful like many of these folks are. And yet these Christian celebrities, that's not the primary way that the gospel goes forth. You wonder how the gospel moves forward? You wonder how the gospel is going to go to your neighbor or to your son or your daughter or your spouse? You wonder how the gospel is going to go there? It's going to go there through no names like you and me. It happens when we decide to go to our neighbors with the good news of Jesus. You see, the people of Antioch, they weren't interested in the Christian celebrities. They didn't know anything about the Apostle Peter. And they cared nothing for John. But they noticed when these no-names from Cyprus and Cyrene showed up, cared for them, and told them about Jesus. You know, our neighbors... They don't know anything about David Platt or David Jeremiah. And they don't know that our Mr. Rogers is named Adrian Rogers. They don't care about our celebrities. And they don't care because they don't need them. What they need is people like you and me. People who will go to them with the good news of Jesus. That's what's happening here. These no-names, these men, are going to Antioch, spreading the gospel of Jesus with intentionality, and the Lord blessed it. The Lord's hand is with them, verse 21, and a great number of people believed it and turned to the Lord. You know, that's amazing. Just ordinary people doing an ordinary thing, and the Lord is blessing and he blessed it so much that the language of the city is changed. And they wonder, what are we going to call these people? And what are we going to do with them? And how are we going to differentiate them? We'll call them Christ because they're like, like Christ. Call them little Christ. Christians. And it happened because no names decided to go. Second, no to be a Christian is far more than simply going. To be a Christian is to know Christ. To be a Christian is to know Christ. The church in Jerusalem, they get word that all these people in Antioch are coming to faith in Christ, and they hear these converts who now know Christ, and so they send Barnabas down to check it out. And Barnabas from the church in Jerusalem goes to Antioch, and he goes there to see, do these people really know Christ or not? They send Barnabas because Barnabas is the perfect guy for the job. And Barnabas knows conversion when he sees it. Do you remember in Acts chapter 9 when Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul, remember when he comes to faith? It's Barnabas who talks with Saul. And it's Barnabas who convinces the church, hey, this guy is not a wolf in sheep's clothing. This guy is the real deal. He really is is a Christian. Barnabas is the guy who knows conversion when he sees it. Barnabas arrives in Antioch. He looks at these new Christians. In verse 23, he sees the grace of God. You know, that's such a neat little phrase. He sees the grace of God. These people, they, they really and truly know Jesus. And Barnabas says, that's the grace of God. You know how easy it would be, you know, just to see this in a different light? You know, this is an on-church culture, and these are people who have no affiliation and no affinity for the Bible. These are untaught Christians. You know, they don't know John 3.16. Like, not only do they not know the verse, they don't know who John is. They don't know why there's a three there. They don't know why that three separate with a colon from verse 16. They don't know what 16 is. 
They, they don't know anything. But actually, there's a few things they know. They know that Jesus is God. They know that this Jesus became a man. They know that he is the God-man, and they know that he lived the perfect life, and then he died on the cross, not because of any of his wrongs, but he died in our place for what we have done. They know that he entered into heaven and is now sitting at the right hand of God the Father, ruling and reigning his universe. And they know that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And they know that all who believe this message and accept this message will live with him forever. They may not know John 3.16, but they know that. Now they're new Christians. And they have miles to go in their walk with Christ. Miles to go in ethics and business and sexuality. Miles to go in relationships, how they treat others. Miles to go in language, just how they speak to one another. Miles to go in how they become like Jesus. But they know Christ. And they love Christ. And Barnabas sees it. And Barnabas sees that they know Christ, and he says, this is the grace of God. When I was in college, I did an internship at a mega church near Cleveland. The church had about 5,000 attendants on any Sunday morning. The pastor of the church encouraged me to go check out their addiction ministry. And so on a Tuesday night, I went down into the basement where these addicts were meeting. And they were seated in groups of about 10 or more. And they were talking with one another and they were sharing their struggles. And honestly, I remember thinking to myself, being candid here. I'm thinking, this is a mess. And I was sorry that people lived like this. And hearing their struggles made me sad. And then after a little while, that stopped. And a guy got up with a guitar. And they began to sing. And let me tell you, these addicts knew how to sing. And not necessarily on key, but they knew how to raise a joyful noise to the Lord. And the guy up front and the guitar, that was all drowned out because of the singing of these people. And they were excited and jubilant because they knew Jesus. They knew Jesus. And it changed their lives. That's what Barnabas sees. He sees the grace of God. And you know, by God's grace, it was in that moment that I saw the grace of God. And these people still had their rough spots, but I began to see that these people know Jesus. And just being honest with you, before this moment, I thought the grace of God was upstairs. And I thought the grace of God was wealthy people in well-ordered pews, in nice clothes, with the big houses, and the new cars, and the picket fence, and the kids in one of the best schools in the state. I thought that was the grace of God. But the grace of God was downstairs. And the grace of God was with those who knew Jesus. That's what Barnabas says. How easy it is to conflate those two things. How easy it is to conflate worldly success with the grace of God. But not for Barnabas. Barnabas gets it right. Those who know Jesus know God's grace. Barnabas says of these folks, he says, this is God's grace. And then he encourages them, verse 23, he says, you know, you just stay after it. And he encourages them to remain true in the Lord with all their heart. And that's just a good word this morning. That's what a Christian does. When a Christian truly knows Christ, our desire is to stay after it. It's like a drug. Like when we get a little taste of what it's like to know Christ, we want to know more. And once we know him, there's an increased desire to know more of him. That's what's happening here. Barnabas tells him, hey, remain true to the Lord. And what's the result of remaining true to the Lord? Well, there's many, and we've covered these through our study of 1 John. There's increased assurance of salvation, and there's increased joy, and increased peace, and all these things that we desire. But there's one more thing that stems from knowing the Lord. 
and remaining in the Lord. The other thing that happens when we know the Lord and remain in the Lord is verse 24, a great number of other people are brought to the Lord. You know, these people who are truly converted, who truly know Christ and who they believe in Christ, their lives are changing, and other people began to take notice of that. And these other people on the outside who notice what's happening to these Christians on the inside, they say, I want a part of that. I want to be in. I want to know Jesus like you know Jesus. You want to be faithful in your evangelism this morning? You want the people who you're with to know Jesus? You want your children or grandchildren to call out to the Lord? You want your neighbors to know Christ or your co-worker? You want to be faithful in evangelism? We can learn from their example here. These people are honest about their lives. Honest. They're honest about their failures. And honest that any good thing I have is from the grace of God. God showed his grace in my life. And then they attribute that grace to knowing Jesus. You see, being a Christian is about being a professional. Being a Christian isn't about being well put together. Being a Christian isn't coming from the right stock. Being a Christian isn't a being a hard worker. Being a Christian isn't any of those things. Being a Christian is about knowing Jesus. Knowing who he is and knowing what he's done for me. And then the third way to be faithful in evangelism is to live the Christian life. To live for Christ because we know him. You know, that's not, that's not a duty, that's a delight. Like, I know him, and so I want to live for him. That's what these people are doing. They're being honest about their lives, and they're attributing it to the grace of God, and then they're living their Christian life, not from duty, but from delight. And what do we see happening? We see many people coming to know Christ. It's God's transforming work. He begins to transform some. Others see it, and now they want to know him as well. Third, grow. Grow. To be a Christian is to grow in Christ. Barnabas recognized that these people know the Lord, but he also recognized that they need to grow in Christ. And so Barnabas begins to look for help. Verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. After Saul is converted... Saul begins to preach, and Saul is a very good preacher. In fact, Saul is such a good preacher that some of these Jews decide that Saul needs to stop preaching, as as in they need to kill him. You know, Saul is leading many people to faith in Christ, and when these people come to know Christ, uh, Saul just begins to continue to teach them, and they begin to grow in Christ. And they say, we've got to stop this. It's happened so many times that the Apostle Paul, Saul, begins to fear for his life. And so his friends, they lead him down in a basket, and he heads to Tarsus. This is when Barnabas begins to think, you know, Saul's in Tarsus, and he's just hiding out. And I have all of these new Christians here in Antioch. Why don't I go get Saul to teach them? These people need to grow. Saul's the man for the job. And so Barnabas goes to Tarsus, and he finds Saul, and then he brings him back, and Saul begins to teach them. No one's better for this job than Saul. Saul knows what it is to be converted. Saul knows what it is to have his life radically changed. He knows what it is to have his life going in one direction and then to meet Christ and then have his life radically changed. And he knows what it's like to be so drawn to Christ that everything is now different. That's these Christians. Their life is now completely different. They're now called Christians. By the way, when they're called Christians, that's said with a snide remark. Is it? Look at these weirdos, Christians. 
Saul knows what it is to be considered with a snide remark. Saul knows what it is to lose all things, to lose not only material possessions, but also to lose family and to lose all respect because of Christ. Saul knows these things. Saul is the perfect man for the job to help them grow in their faith. So Saul goes to Antioch. And notice verse 26, Saul spent an entire year with them. Saul gives a year of his life to these new Christians in Antioch. And so notice here the obvious, that Christian growth takes time. And so for a year, Saul preached regularly. And when I mean regular, I mean probably like every single night. And they regularly and systematically went through the Bible. You know, so oftentimes we look for the home run in Christian growth. We're looking for the home run. And we long for the sermon that's just going to change my life. And maybe we even look for different preachers. If I just find the right guy who can knock it out of the park for me. Or maybe it's the Christian music. And we just long for the song that's going to fill our soul. And you know, sometimes that happens. Sometimes the Lord so ordains things that the song speaks to us, or sometimes the Lord so ordains the week that the, that the sermon really is a home run. But that's not typical. Christian growth is about the base hit. Christian growth is what takes place in the average and the mundane intake of God's word. You know, I went through and did some math this week. As I look back at my life, I have sat under at least 2,000 sermons. Preached 500 of them myself. Sat through over 1,000 hours of Bible training for some of the best Bible teachers in the world. And here's the thing. I can hardly recite a few lines from any of those. As I think back of all those things, no no little lines or nuggets really even stand out to me. There's precious few things I remember. But I know this, As I look back upon my life of 37 years, without a doubt, those 2,000 sermons and those 500 sermons preached and those thousands of hours in Bible classrooms have changed my life and caused me to grow in Christ. Church, we cannot discount the regular intake of God's Word can't discount the regular, mundane, average sermon. It feels so ordinary, and it feels like, well, maybe I just don't need that anymore. Maybe I just need the next guy. But oh no, the average and the ordinary over time is growing us in Christ. And this is exactly what we see happening in verse 27. We meet this guy that we don't know anything of. His name's Agabus, and he's a prophet, and and he speaks for God. He says, hey, there's going to be this famine. And so these Christians hear that this famine's coming, and they decide, you know what we're going to do? We're going to give our money to help those in this coming famine. You know how amazing that is? These people in Antioch, they don't know any of these people in Judea. They don't know them. They've never met them. Just a few weeks ago, months ago, they would have cared nothing about this. But now their lives are beginning to change. And they're growing in compassion. And they're growing in a trust for God. And they're growing in a love for neighbor. We have verse 27 because it shows us that these people are now mature. They're mature Christians. They've grown in Christ-likeness. It's a changed life what growing in Christ looks like. Not a one-time change, but a continual change. 
Antioch is the first place that these people are called Christians. And they look at these people who are now changed. They began to marvel and they say, hey, these people are now different. And they wonder what's happening here. And they realize that their life is so radically changed that it must be because of this Christ that they talk about. And so they call them Christians. So the question, what about us this morning? What about us? What are others going to say when they look at our life? Would others say, hey, you know that guy? Or that lady, they must be a Christian? You know, they're just different. And they don't really fit any category. And they're always talking about Christ. I bet they're different because they're a Christian. I pray that's true of us this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we pray this morning that if there there are people listening, people under the sound of, uh, of this microphone who don't know you, Father, we pray that you would make yourself known to them. Father, we pray that your grace would be in their life, that they would see you and come to know you and come to live for you. And Father, for others of us this morning who do know you, Father, we pray that we'd be willing to go where you lead us. Father, send us where you would lead. Cause us to go to those who do not know you. And Father, we pray that you would bless us as we speak to them. And lastly, Father, we pray that each of us would grow in you. Father, we pray that you would use this average, ordinary, mundane sermon and make us just a little bit more like your son, In Christ's name we pray. Amen. sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. This grace has brought me safe thus far. Grace will lead me home. <coughs> good to me his words my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures when we've been there ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun.
Now hear this benediction from Romans chapter 10. How then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. If you have heard the good news this morning, go believing that. And go sharing that good news with others. You are dismissed.